Kuchu. Ông chung đẹp cảm to khi tham gia tại phi sản bạc ca, bắt đầu từ ca chuyên từ xã Bình Nhàn tại Chiết làm mấy lần vừa đây rồi thành tổ. Thank you, Mr. President. We will try to address several points raised by the defense. The most important points we feel raised by the defense during their oral presentations uh, and also some that they didn't mention but that are in their written briefs. One of the points the defense made uh, concerned the prosecution arguments, my arguments about the definition of genocide and how it applied to the CHAM. And the Nunchi defense said, well, this would amount to a violation of the principle of nulli crimis in lege, the principle of legality, that the prosecution was arguing for the chamber to convict Nunchi of some conduct that wasn't a crime at the time it was committed in 1975. That's what that principle means, that you cannot convict someone of conduct if the time they did the act, the conduct was not illegal. Honest genocide was illegal in 1975. The genocide convention, which I was quoting from, the destruction of the group as such. Those are the words of the 1949 Genocide Convention. They're not new. I talked about the fact that the five genocidal acts, the groups of acts that are part of that convention that can amount to genocide, including include transferring children. So I pointed out the logic that therefore the destruction of the group cannot be limited simply to biological destruction. But clearly by the terms of the 1949 convention, you can destroy a group as such, such as a religious group, without necessarily killing the members of the group or all of the members of the group. The individuals can live on, but the group can be destroyed. We made the same point in our written submissions in more detail. Neither defense team has taken issue with the logic of our submissions. And we submit that is because it, it simply is logical. There's nothing to dispute about that interpretation. The words are clear. Also, in relation to the genocide of the Cham, uh, the Nunchia defense mentioned that they felt that the chamber excluded Prach Chamar Security Center from the scope of the 2 2 trial to their disadvantage. But Your Honor has actually asked all parties to submit on the scope of the 2 2 trial before we began. None of the parties, we wanted to do this trial as efficiently as possible. We wanted not to necessarily do every single site. We selected sites. Neither defense team asked to have Prach Chamar included because there's nothing about including that that would have been to their advantage. They understood. The defense teams, both of them, I believe, also made the general claim that Cham were arrested as part of security concerns of the DK government. As if, for some reason, if you decide to destroy a group, that if you do it for reasons of the security of your nation, that's not genocide. That's not the case. In the Stockage Appeal Judgment, paragraph 45, they clearly distinguish intent for genocide from motive. Those are two different concepts. If you intend to destroy a group, it doesn't matter if you do it out of racial animus, you do it because you think the group is a threat 
you do it for economic solely for security concerns. So we've had have evidence of children, for example, three and four-year-old children, Saint Khoi testified he transported to Wat Atrakun to be killed. We've had evidence about Vietnamese babies being killed in S21. In uh, Vietnam, the bankers and all this shows that there wasn't discrimination. Actually, the prosecution case has always been, as we've explained, that the policy towards the Jam evolved over time. And the evidence has shown that. And with many witnesses that came and testified at the trial, including Lisa Osman, the expert talked about the fact that Jam actually joined the Khmer Rouge movement in high numbers. Many of them were loyal to King Sihanouk, and they were opposed to the Long Nol regime. Many of them joined the regime. But over time, starting in about 1973, the CPK increasingly began a policy of trying to destroy the Jam religious and cultural traditions. And Matt Lee, for example, certainly doesn't help the defense. In interviews, one of the things he talked about was a 1974 Congress that he attended, in which Pot, Pol Pot was also there. And Matt Lee mentioned uh, it would be nice to allow Cham to bury their dead according to their own tradition, which is different than the Khmer tradition. The Jam, the body is buried with the head to the north and the foot to the south. And he told the interviewer that Pol Pot called him aside after the Congress scared him. Pol Pot told Matt Lee, since we had joined the revolution, while the body was buried, was up to the revolution. And that's consistent with what the witnesses said, beginning in 73, but much more after 1975, I apologize to interrupt, Mr. President. Look, um, um, but I do like um, the prosecution um, but the interview I just mentioned in fact was with DC Cam, that's B3 slash 7821. Uh, but but, but counsel is absolutely correct. Uh, Matt Lee also spoke to Ben Kiernan. Um, also in E3 slash 390, Matt Lee talked about what happened to his own family under the Pol Pot regime. He said he lost, he said Pol Pot killed, Pol Pol Pot killed Pol Pot my wife, three of my children, three children-in-law, nine grandchildren, three of whom were infants. So Matt Lee does not help the defense, this example of Matt Lee. Again, in E3, 7821, he was asked if there was a policy against the Cham, and he said, yes, not only were the Cham targeted, but he also mentioned the Vietnamese as being targeted, he said, even more badly by the regime. Now, the defense spent quite a bit of time in the Nunchi of Defense talking about the theories of communism and 
ហើយជាការបដិសេធនៃសិទ្ធិមួយដ្ឋានបំពេញជាជនធ្វើការដោយគ្មានប្រាក់ពីវត្តការទទួលហើយសាកោទាំងអស់ហ្នឹងអាច
said in that, we cited it uh, in our brief in footnotes 3245 and the following footnote for the propositions that every confession was recorded and summarized in a notebook, and secondly, that these summaries were then signed up and delivered to the district office. So we certainly agree with the Q-Sampan defense that it is absolutely improper to use the contents of confessions in these security centers, whereas I will explain these are all the product of torture. Also, the Q Sampan defense says that we rely on WRIs. I understood them for the majority of our submissions on the Vietnamese. That also is not true. If you look at our section on the treatment of Vietnamese, there are 534 footnotes, 513 times. We cite to trial testimony. Now, the Nunchia defense said there is nothing in the documents to indicate a policy against the Vietnamese. They did not address Pol Pot's speech about killing 50 million Vietnamese. The army of Vietnam numbered 50 million. That was the population of the entire country. Also, they did not address, we can have this slide, please, um, uh, E3 slash 1094. This document, which was a report from the West Zone, we mentioned it in our oral submissions already, but they did not address it. But in that document, it, the West Zone reported that it had applied the party's line to routinely remove, screen, and sweep clean enemies by screening for UN aliens. It says aliens. It doesn't say soldiers. It doesn't even say spies, as they like to call civilians. It simply says aliens. And what were the results? According to that report, it indicated smashed 100 ethnic UN, including small and big adults and children. So this document makes absolutely clear we have a written report to the center saying we are fulfilling the center's policy against the UN and we're killing them, including children. But perhaps no document is more telling about the policy and about the genocide of the Vietnamese than E3 4604. That was the Revolutionary Flag magazine for April 1978. In that magazine, <coughs> they wrote, and now, how about the UN? There are no UN in Cambodia territory. Formerly, there were nearly one million of them. Now, there is not one seed of them to be found. I just heard that um, loud bang. And perhaps I'm wondering if the Nunchea defense thinks that there's a coup, because when a grenade goes off, they believe there's a coup. But I'll come back to that in just a moment. I just thought I'd take advantage of the sound to preview my argument on that. Your Honor, the defense also talked about challenge a policy to destroy Buddhism. And if I understood, if I recall correctly, they said that there were no witnesses about monks being defrocked. They didn't call witnesses who themselves were defrocked. There were several witnesses in this case who were defrocked. Chin Sarun testified on the 3rd of August, 2016. He said, yes, it was after the 17th of April 1975 that I was defrocked, but I was told to leave the monkhood because the regime said that there would be no more monks in the regime. Kiev New testified on the 21st of June 2012. 
He said, when we were ordered to disrobe, he just did that so we could survive. He said, a group of Khmer Rouge came to instruct all the monks in Ang Raka Pagoda to leave their monkhood. M. Fung, the defense did mention him. He testified on the 16th of February, 19, uh, 2015. As for leaving the monkhood, all monks did not dare to refuse. We were afraid because there were instructions from Anka, and if we didn't follow it, it would be a matter that we had to concern about. Chil Chuan, a witness requested by the defense, said he was a monk. And he said, um, well, he said he was forced to disrobe and that if he could, he would return to Buddhism. Mian Lui, 2nd of September 2015, testified in the morning the Khmer Rouge soldiers, who were the messengers of the district chief, came to insist that we should leave the monkhood, that we would not be allowed to be in monkhood anymore in the near future. And if we look at a CPK document, A3-99, it's a document about the follow-up of implementation of the political line, it's dated 22 September 1975, and the party wrote in that document, most of the monks, from 90 to 95 percent of them, abandoned their monkhood. Pagodas, which are the core foundations for the existence of the monkhood, were abandoned. People no longer have gone to the pagoda. They no longer offer alms. We assume that 90 to 95 percent of the monks and Buddhist practices will no longer exist. So this special layer of the society will no longer cause any worry. Now the defense position is, oh, this was just a voluntary decision by the Cambodian people and by the monks to abandon the religion. What sense does that make? At a time when people needed religion most, why would they give up the religion? We know today Cambodians continue to practice Buddhism. The only reason Buddhism did not exist for the three years and eight months of the DK regime was because it was forcibly prohibited by the regime. In fact, M. Phong even testified that while he himself was able to avoid this because he was well known, other monks were forced to marry. One of his friends was forced to get married. Now, there also were some defense legal arguments about other inhumane acts. Several of the charges in this case concerned this residual category of crimes against humanity. I don't want to get too technical. We discussed that in our brief, and we've done it in prior briefs. And there's a lot of jurisprudence already from this tribunal and others. But other inhumane acts was a crime in 1975. That's absolutely clear. It's a residual category because international law has said we don't leave vacuums for cruel perpetrators to make up conduct that wasn't yet called inhumane and get away with it. When conduct rises to the level of other inhumane acts, that is a crime. So other types of treatment have been considered, besides forced marriage, for example, uh, as other inhumane acts. Cruel, humiliating, inhumane or degrading treatment. There's cases which we cite in our brief that call those uh, other inhumane acts. Forced prostitution has been found to be an other inhumane act. Inflicting serious mental injury, inflicting deplorable conditions of detention, forcing people to witness criminal acts against family or friends, 
and forced nudity. All of these have been examples of conduct that was found to rise to the level of other inhumane acts. Now, the defense, particularly the defense for Hu Sampan, spent a long time yesterday arguing all forced marriage doesn't rise to that level. It's not so serious. And they, Your Honours, we've had the testimony of the victims of forced marriage. This is something that has changed people's lives. It was extremely traumatic at the time it occurred, and for many it has left scars that last a lifetime. Mental scars, and in some cases even physical scars. One of the witnesses you will recall was a man who talked about how he ran into his former fiancé. And they both talked about all that they had lost by this forced marriage policy where he was forced to marry someone else. And all they could conclude is that perhaps in the next life they would be together. So this conduct, which affects families, it affects the children from those families, certainly rises to the level of another inhumane act is extremely, extremely serious and cruel conduct. I also want to talk about the two experts who testified because the defense teams misrepresented or selectively represented what they testified to in a way that distorts uh, the value of their testimony. First, I want to talk about the witness requested by the Q Sampan defense. Peg Levine. It's true, she said she does not characterize the weddings as forced. She did this study where she said she, quote, worked very hard to not even ask, unquote, couples whether they felt their marriages were forced or not. So how could she possibly come to a conclusion when she didn't ask the people, she wasn't there, didn't ask the people involved, did they consent, did they feel forced in these weddings? And she actually testified that most of the interviews she conducted were done by students. They weren't a random selection of people from the DK regime. She sent out students who talked to friends of their parents. So we had young people talking to more elderly people. And we saw her protocol of the questions to ask, and none of them concerned whether the couples consented to the marriage or not. As she said, she avoided asking that question. And yet, despite the fact that she didn't ask them, in the interviews, some of the uh, responses make it absolutely clear that these couples were forced to marry. Two men said that they first refused to be married, and they were punished for that by hard labor. Other witnesses said that they married the spouse chosen by the authorities because one said they could not protest. Another said that she did not agree, but she was afraid of being killed, so she agreed. A third said, I had to follow Ankar or I would be killed. A fourth told Levine, or one of her students, she did not agree, but said Ankar killed people. And a fifth older woman told her, that she said she felt she must marry or she would be killed. And yet somehow Levine says she does not consider these marriages force, even though the people told her to be married because they were afraid they'd be killed if they refused. She even talked about a woman named Moni. Moni was a highly educated she worked for the Khmer Rouge, preparing lists of people to be killed. 
she was ordered to marry an uneducated base person, and she didn't want to marry him, she said. She told the maid. She didn't want to marry anyone, for that matter. She said she only went through with that wedding because her father told her, if you refuse, they're going to kill me. So Levine's evidence make it, makes it absolutely clear that these marriages were forced, people married because of the incredibly hostile, the terror environment of the DK regime. You simply did not refuse an instruction from the authorities from Angkor. To do that would have consequences that people uh, did not know what they would be, but they were afraid reasonably could even lead to their death. The other witness, Ms. Nakagawa, said that she started her research on sexual violence. And she was asked some questions about well, what was the DK policy. Did she